anyone who has been out, let's say, camping, and then you've come back into the city on a hot summer's day, and you think, God, it's so much hotter here in the city. That's actually a, a really common phenomenon. It's called the urban heat island effect. This is The Butterfly Effect, a podcast that shows the big impact a small action can do. Tali Orad is talking to those special people that make a difference with nature and trees. Welcome everyone to The Butterfly Effect. My name is Tali Orad. I'm your host and your butterfly here. Today on the show, I'll be speaking with Ross Okali. Ross is an urban design and planning consultant based in London. When he is not helping clients have a better urban environment, he hosts the Green Urbanist podcast, where he explores how planners, architects, nature lover, and policymaker can make cities more sustainable, healthy, and happy. I am very happy to have Ross on the show today. Welcome, Ross, to the Butterfly Effect. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Ross, can we start with sharing more in details about what's an urban designer? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a bit of a create your own adventure job title mm-hmm. because um, basically it's it started because particularly in, in the UK where I work, so I'm, I'm based in London, we have planners and planners write a lot of policy and they do a lot of very high level strategic stuff. And then we have architects mm-hmm. who do very detailed, you know, building design. And then basically we, we realized there was something missing in the middle <laughs> where someone who could just come in and understand the high level, understand how buildings work, understand transportation and uh, urban greening, and basically have a foot in all the different aspects that make cities mm-hmm. and then try and tie that all together. So that's basically what urban designers do. They basically know a little enough about everything to be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> And then try and tie everything together and make make places very uh, holistic and and you know just good places to be. So that's really what it's about. That's very cool. And how do you consider nature and green in in city planning? Because of the way the sort of professions are are sort of uh, specialized, we also have landscape architects and and landscape designers, mm-hmm. and often urban greening, trees planting is sort of left to that person to do and it's sort of put on at the end of the design process which is a real really the opposite of how it should should happen you should start with the landscape and start with the natural elements and then basically do everything else around that so for me that's how i think about it is i think about what's what are the fundamental aspects of this place what's the topography like what are the the natural resources that are there in terms of trees and waterways mm-hmm. you know what's the climate like all that kind of stuff is the very first thing I would look at. And then buildings and everything can be adapted to that. Right. So the, the type of building, the materials, the location of greenery, that's what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, I think we we have for many years had a an idea that there's the urban environment and then there's the natural environment. And those things are separate. I think that's actually nonsense. <laughs> so... <laughs> Actually, the two things are totally intertwined uh, and you can't separate them at all because we need, you know, we we rely on natural elements like trees and soil, precipitation, you know, just to survive, whether we're in a city or we're out in the middle of the wilderness. So right. the two things can't really be separated. And I think actually I call I call myself an urban designer. The podcast is called The Green Urbanist, but actually the urban area, I think we shouldn't focus too much on that. Trees not only shade like concrete surfaces, right, from sun rays, but they also transpire or release water into the air through their leaves. I mean, this process cools things down and bring temperature down in cities. Nowadays, we, we saw groundbreaking temperature in, in many of the big cities around the world. So we should definitely consider that. Any other advantages you see when you look at uh, planning and, and designing an urban environment? I mean, there, there are so many benefits to to trees specifically and, and urban greening in general. I don't need to tell you about the, the sense of well-being and health that we all get from, from being out in nature and from having contact with, uh, with natural elements, with mm-hmm. plants. Um, and that is 
you know, even more important in cities because cities are stressful places. You know, they aren't our natural in, uh, habitat. And so we're always sort of dealing with a, a baseline level of stress when we're in cities, whether it's the noise and the air pollution, uh, having to deal with so many people around. Uh, there's a lot of things that are just, you know, the, the hard surfaces, the gray, gray colors. And so having more and more nature brought in cities is, is kind of a buffer for us against that stress. It's very, very important for our well-being, both mental and, and physical. You know, and, that, and that's always been the case in cities. But I think looking forward, we're now in this age of, of climate change and trees are becoming more and more important as a kind of climate change adaptation measure. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned about the cooling and there's also the benefit of sort of buffering against flooding. So maybe I can talk about the cooling. Cooling first. So you shared a really interesting article with me before we, we had our podcast today about um, research that was done in 2019 where researchers found that, you know, to get the, the full benefit of the shade that trees provide, you need to have 40% canopy cover. So that means... You know, if you're looking down on a city from uh, from the sky, it's almost 50 percent should be covered in trees. Yeah. And so that sounds fantastic. And, and the reason this is so important is because anyone who has been out, let's say, camping and then you've come back into the city on a hot summer's day and you think, God, it's so much hotter here in the city. That's actually a, a, a really common uh, phenomenon. It's called the urban heat island effect. Mm hmm. The hard surfaces in cities like concrete and, and steel and glass, they basically store heat. Um, and so it's not uncommon for a city like Paris, you know, a very large, dense city, to be 10 degrees hotter than the surrounding countryside. Now, this might not be a problem for much of the year, but when you get a heat wave or when you get a really, really hot summer day, that starts to push the temperatures up into a dangerous range. And it could be very harmful to health. And particularly people who are already vulnerable um, are at risk of dying in those, those kind of conditions. And so now we're talking about trees as p potentially life-saving devices. Right. Because if you have enough trees in an urban area, you get enough shade, it can actually reduce the, uh, the air temperature by enough to, you know, really, really make a difference between life or death for someone um, who's in a vulnerable situation there. And of course, this is getting more and more common uh, with climate change. So that's one of the really key elements, I think, of, of getting more trees, especially allowing trees to grow mature and getting that big canopy cover. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm glad that you bring up this research and that 40% green coverage, 40% is a lot. Yes. And when we think of, of a city, I see most of it is gray. I don't see much green. And there is a reason for that, right? A lot of people work there. A lot of people are there. You need to have transportation. So there's a lot of obstacles to achieve that 40% green. Is there a method, a way to overcome those obstacles? Yeah. So maybe just put that in perspective. I mean, if we think, if we take two, the two cities that we're in, I'm in London, you're in New York. Is that right? Yep. So London, I had a look online and London, they reckon, is about has about 21% tree cover. So it's it's mm -hmm. only halfway there. And London is known as a green city. And in fact, it has this special status of being a national park city. Yes. Because it has so many trees and so many, you know, really good uh, green open spaces. Mm -hmm. New York, I'm a bit unsure about. I saw a few different analysis. It's somewhere between 24 and 39%. Because of probably Central Park. And, and that's that's the interesting part, because you get these um, hubs, you know, you get these sort of density of trees, which seems could well bring the average up. But then you'll have neighborhoods that are totally barren in terms of greenery. And so having that sort of equitable access is really important as well. And is that beneficial enough when it's like that? I would think that the most important thing, first of all, is to is to, you know, improve the areas that are nature have a nature deficit. Uh, you know, some some people call them green deserts. You know, there, there's parts mm -hmm. of cities that just don't have that density of greenery that you need. They don't have parks. They don't have trees. And that's really bad for the residents, you know. So I, I would think from an, equ uh, from an equality point of view, I'd be wanting to focus on improving those areas first. Right. Now, in terms of how you do that, as you said, it's tricky in cities because most cities are pretty well built out already. 
it's it's difficult to find where there is space. But actually, when you start to look at cities a bit closer, you start to find all the leftover spaces that there are, mm-hmm. particularly in older cities, because you get these funny plots. You know, you might have like a strange triangular bit at the end that no one <laughs> knows what to do with. And so that's just left a bit abandoned. You have vacant lots, you know, vacant sites. And actually, all these are opportunities to get more greening in. And I, I've, you know, I've been lucky on my podcast to have some real experts um, on. And I just had a conversation with a guy called um, James uh, Godfrey Fawcett. And he's a specialist in the Miyawaki method of mm-hmm. afforestation. And that was really fascinating to me. So I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert, but the, the Miyawaki method is, is basically a, a methodology that was developed in Japan. And it's a way of basically taking native tree species and they pay a lot of attention to making the soil really high quality. And they basically mm-hmm. plant very, very dense in can be relatively small areas of land. Right. And, they, and you can use that to create urban forests within, you know, just a few years. So I think that actually holds a lot of potential. I would love to see more examples of that. And, and well, I mean, there's lots of examples all around the world, but I'd, I'd like to actually go and see some myself. <laughs> I know. So that's one of the things that I, I don't think I've seen much of them, not in London and not in New York. And the Miyawaki forests, and they're also known by the name, the tiny forests. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I, I know about them is that they include trees that grow very, very quickly and absorb more CO2 than plantation right. grow for timber, for example. So they definitely provide that green lung that we are so desperately need. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we didn't even mention the carbon sequestration element. I think that's almost a given, isn't it? The more trees we plant, the better from that point of view. Yes, yes. And they are burst, as you said, with biodiversity that can thrive in like tiny areas like tennis courts or or that. Yeah, Um, they they actually, James was telling me he he has an an initiative where they plant what they call pocket forests. And he said he, he had just planted one in someone's back garden that was three square meters. Um, and they planted 12 saplings. So that's really the extreme <laughs> end of the tiny forest. Yeah, that's amazing. I just want to like also mention that there are a group that stress that the Miyawaki forest should not be seen as an alternative to protecting existing native forest. Yeah. Um, so because the small, right, the small unconnected wooded area can never replace the large traced of forest that is vital to so many species and that remain under threat from commercial plantations and and farming. So it's not a replacement in addition. So as you said, if we have like this tiny extra area, we should use it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, in terms of areas within cities that are We'll say not not really fit for for the sort of far you know afforestation. There are sort of innovative methods of greening as well. So we all know about green roofs at this point. Uh, such an underused resource in cities, just flat roofs on office buildings, residential buildings, where you can go up mm-hmm. and put a a layer of um, of soil and greenery, and that has a really really good impact on um, the air temperature as well, as well as being good for like flying insects and birds and that kind of thing. And you can also do green walls. A lot of these popping up around London. I'll give another plug for my podcast here because I had a, a green wall expert on uh, a few months ago called uh, Niall McAvoy. And uh, we talked all about that's a way where you have a really constrained urban area where there's just no space for doing surface level planting. You mm-hmm. have all this space on the, the blank walls on the side of buildings where you can have lots and lots of greenery. Um, so I think those are really exciting. And I think those are sort of last resorts when you can't get in a proper tree or you can't get in a park. Uh, You can at least get a little bit in that helps biodiversity, helps with air quality, and also has that visual sense that we get the the benefit of it just by seeing it as well. Right. And there's also the insects that is important for us to have. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you in terms of the obstacles to get those green areas in a city. Is that from... Usually the city council, is that because cities are already built? What is it that's stopping us from getting more green? I think there's multiple layers of complexity here. So I think we can tackle it, you know, if you think about street trees. So you think, you know, why isn't there trees on every street? One of the reasons is that, 
you know, we keep all of our utilities, you know, electricity, broadband, gas pipes, everything underneath our pavements. And so often there just isn't the room underneath the pavement to actually plant a tree and give it space uh, to have roots. So there, there are many, you know, streets where you might you might think they'd be perfect for for planting some street trees, but not unless you want to have broadband as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that can be just a very practical issue. And I would say maybe a bit of lack of foresight, maybe when those utilities were put in, there wasn't space yeah. left for, for other things. And then there's also you know just issues around land ownership. Uh, cities are a real patchwork of different land ownerships, different private landowners, and it just depends on whether they are game to, um, you know, to have these things, you know, being used on their site to have trees planted, to incorporate green spaces where they might have uh, vacant sites or they might have leftover space. Many landowners just you know don't want to, the hassle of it. So I think. There, there's also an element of spelling out the benefits. And I think for people who aren't really motivated by the intrinsic benefits of, mm-hmm. of urban greening and trees, there's actually really good economic arguments for bringing in more greening in cities as well. And I know maybe for people like us who, who are just nature lovers, it feels a bit gross to put like a dollar value on, on nature. Right. But there's been lots of studies and lots of research done on that. So for instance, if you take a... Uh, two identical streets. One of them has uh, street trees. The other one has no trees. The property prices are higher. Property values are higher on the the street with trees. You know, properties that face a park have higher property values. So this all has economic benefits for the landowners that you can spell out to them quite clearly and say, you know, you're really missing a trick here if you're not incorporating greening into your into your land. You know, right. So sometimes there's a bit of a communication thing there for people who are a bit economically minded i suppose yeah well it's it all, all goes down to education at the end right if we educate people on the benefits of green and also green in terms of dollars then we need to <laughs> yes, change exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah well you you mentioned a lot about the green urbanist what made you start that the reason i s- sort of studied to become an urban designer and a planner was because I, I wanted to make a positive impact in terms of climate change, sustainability. And what I found through my studies and working over the years is that most people, myself included, uh, within this industry, care about climate change and believe in sustainability, but it's just not a priority. Or it's just, we just don't know enough about it. So, you know, often conversations about sustainability tend to be quite vague you know they tend to be about oh density is good uh so we need more density but there's there's i think there's a lack of uh specificity and clarity around what we actually need cities to be doing and what Mm -hmm. we as urbanists need to be doing over these you know crucial few years as we're at the turning point for climate change so I, i was sort of on this personal journey of trying to figure out what my place in it was and how i could over my career have the most positive impact. And I just decided that there's probably lots of people like me <laughs> who want to know the same things. And so I've, I've basically been using the podcast, the Green Urbanist, as a, a way of structuring my own research and as a way of getting the opportunity to talk to experts. That's cool. And what did you learn that you can share with us? I've, I have been really, really fascinated with the, the, the urban greening element because it's just such a proven solution i think i'm quite skeptical of technological solutions and this idea that oh you know in another 10 years the market will deliver you know smart cities and just the technology we need to solve the cl- <laughs> the climate crisis right the thing is we we have the technology already we've had it all the time it's it's just about being closer to to nature and being closer to what we as humans would be doing right and stepping away from you know being being so extractive in a way and so that's been you know something that's been really reinforced for me is this importance of nature in cities i love it and what is your favorite tree my favorite tree so oh well i couldn't possibly pick a favorite but <laughs> this is a good <laughs> uh it's a good opportunity to talk about a, a type of tree that is quite i guess important to me as an irish person which is the irish fairy tree now, fairy trees are usually hawthorn trees, which are a uh, native species in Ireland. And they're kind of a short, 
kind of bushy tree. And you tend to see them sitting on their own in the middle of fields all throughout the Irish countryside. And the reason for this is because we have a a folklore attached to these kind of trees. The old Irish believed that this is where the fairies lived and the trees were the uh, sort of a passageway to the other world, a sort of other universe where the fairies lived. Mm -hmm. And so these trees have been kind of protected over the years. And that's why, you know, uh, you'll have an open field, you know, with cows or sheep grazing, but that tree will not be touched. You know, nobody wants to touch it because (laughs) even though we know it's, you know, illogical to be afraid of fairies, it's just in our culture that you just wouldn't chop it down. You wouldn't prune it or anything Uh, to the point where, uh, I mean, a couple of decades ago now, there was a motorway being built in the west of Ireland in County Clare. Mm -hmm. And it was planned to go straight through uh, a a local fairy tree. And the locals protested this to the point where the government actually diverted the whole motorway around the fairy tree. (laughs) (laughs) So it wouldn't get knocked down. So that's my favorite tree. Oh, I love it. I love that uh, we're using fairies to scare people from cutting down trees. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. <laughs> yeah. How do you say tree in Irish? Uh, very simple word. It's cron. Cron. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That is very cool. Thank you, Ross, so much for joining me today and, and bringing up the benefits of having greener cities. Oh, it's been such a pleasure. Thank, thanks so much for, for contacting me and having me on. It's been great. And thank you everyone for joining me today. We are all beautiful butterflies, each in his and her individual ways. I wanted to thank you for joining me today in this episode. I really appreciate you coming on this journey with me and I hope you can join me next time. And remember, it only takes a small action to make a big difference. Be a butterfly. And that's all for this episode. Thank you for joining us today. Please subscribe to hear more of our stories of change 